Hi, and welcome to Late Night DeFi, the podcast where we look into the evolving space around blockchain technology, decentralized finance, and cryptocurrencies, brought to you by Ernest Young and BlueShift, the portfolio-based decentralized exchange built on Milcomino. I'm Peter Buey, digital content creator for BlueShift. And I'm Igor Mikolev, partner and head of emerging technologies at Dubai Parthenon. Now, we have a whole bunch of new stories that we've been looking at this week in regards to the DeFi NFT space and everything around it. And the very first news item we have here is Meta introduces NFT cross-posting and sharing on Instagram. So Meta, Facebook and Instagram's parent company announces another development in its digital arts initiative. Now, all users on both platforms can connect wallets and share non-fungible tokens across uh, 100 different countries. Now, this is a part of a feature that they've been testing since May uh, earlier this year, and now users be able to cross-post uh, content, tag creators, tag collectors uh, in these posts that they do, and uh, they don't need paying fees. Now, I don't see the point of this at all whatsoever. I, I, I am a huge NFT fan, but I am not a fan of posting this stuff on Instagram where you can just copy and paste it and post it over. And now we can connect our wallets to Meta's platforms. Is is this real? Is this, what are they after here really? All right, yeah. And I think that Facebook and Meta nowadays have a bit of a negative brand equity with regards to using users' data and leveraging it for their own advantage. Um, so, I could only wonder if it will gain any traction this feature. We'll see. I really hope people do realize that when they're connecting their MetaMask or whatever DeFi wallet, they're exposing their entire transaction history and uh, purchasing behaviors to Meta. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to cross-reference your DeFi uh, consumption and usage with whatever they're doing. So yeah. it's, it's really important to realize what Absolutely. You're doing. you don't want that because before you know it, Mark Zuckerberg will connect the dots and uh, sell you some more of his stuff. Exactly, exactly. Now, in some other news, uh, this month seems to be the highest month ever for hacks. The, it's, uh, the month hasn't quite ended yet, and it looks like we may be in for a record high in terms of hacks. So this news item here, crypto hacks are set to be all-time high in 2022, the analysis explains. So research at blockchain intelligence firm chain analysis suggests that this year could outpace 2021 in terms of crypto stolen through hacks. The vast majority of these exploits have been targeted in the field of decentralized finance, that's DeFi, and exploits are mainly due to open source code they are based on and not enough resources have been invested in security on the code level. So this isn't really good at all. And if we look at the uh, the Twitter stats around this, uh, it's, uh, I think it was $718 million worth of uh, digital assets stolen this month alone from 11 hacks, which is absolutely insane. Yeah, this is definitely crazy. And uh, from the conversations with VCs and individual projects, I see that the level of stringency around security is now um, quite high. So people are not accepting any more protocols without thorough code reviews. And even code reviews by reputable parties are not per se taken as a bulletproof measure of uh, unhackability of protocol so that more will be done in the space. And I think we need to come up with a new level of procedures with regards to how do you quality assure your stack of solutions on DeFi. Very, very interesting. We'll, we'll see how this space evolves. It's uh, definitely something that's needed. What we want to talk about today as well is the adoption of cryptos, rising adoption with regards to payments and remittances. Uh, so what happens in Latin America is particularly interesting because nowadays the region makes um, up for 9.1% share of global uh, crypto value received in 2022. And it's not a, not a mistake that now with remittances and high inflation, the adoption like this is um, something to be expected, especially in this region. So the Latin America is the seventh largest crypto market in the world and the value of cryptocurrency received by individuals rocketed to about 40% between July uh, to June 2022, reaching something like 560 billion US dollars. Uh, well, and of course, regions uh, soaring inflation rates also played quite a role in crypto adoption 
right? So you can see a good example of how citizens are trusting less their government, less their local currencies, and there's a bit of a substitution going on with regards to the open cryptocurrencies and digital assets. That's quite interesting. The next part is related to Latin America as well. So in Brazil, you have a bit of a collaboration going on between a digital asset-based um, firm GK8 and uh, 2MZ Market, which is a Brazilian crypto holding company. Uh, so it will give Brazilians even more uh, broad access to a wider range of crypto products and services. Uh, they already have something like uh, 50 billion US dollar on the management on digital assets, but uh, now as Brazil, Brazil is becoming more of a hotbed for crypto adoption, it will be expanded even more and it will give uh, Brazilian citizens even more access to various types of uh, digital currencies and um, other types of assets. I can definitely see these uh, uh, developing economies pick up crypto faster than the developed countries around the world with all the, the red tape or the uh, pre-existing uh, financial instruments that are already existing in uh, common Western societies. Uh, it's hard to break down those barriers, hard to replace them, hard to uh, evolve and iterate. But with uh, uh, economies where they don't have all these facilities already, crypto adoption is so much easier. And, and of course, with the uh, inflation and the fear of fiat as well, uh, in a lot of these countries, uh, crypto is uh, primed to take hold. Yeah, yeah. And listen, we were for a while as well waiting for crypto.com to uh, come to Europe. And finally, it happened uh, with, with quite a bang. So they invested something like 145 million in their new European headquarters. Unfortunately, they didn't come to Amsterdam, but they did come to Paris. And uh, that's where the regional headquarters will be. Uh, so a uh, French digital asset service provider license is going to be uh, received as it's expected in September. So yeah, um, congratulations to uh, Crypto.com and uh, definitely looking forward to collaborating in the future. I heard those uh, digital asset service provider licenses are quite sought after in uh, France. It just makes it a lot easier for a lot of these exchanges to operate in the EU. Uh, is, is that correct? Yeah, definitely. It's a bit of a gray area, but uh, surely a local presence and a local license makes uh, the situation more favorable with regards to relationships with regulators and local authorities. So I think it's truly the right move. Makes sense. Next to Crypto.com coming to Europe, we have um, some of the existing players like Bitpanda and N26 launching their own cryptocurrency related partnership, uh, right? So that the, the fintech N22 themselves will be launching crypto trading on their mobile app, right? Which is quite cool, I think, for Europe. So in the US, we saw some of that happening for a while, but in Europe, it's quite new. Um, so that starting from Austria and rolling out to other countries in the upcoming months, N26 uh, Crypto will let its customers buy and sell over 200 cryptocurrencies, uh, including Bitcoin and Ether. So the platform will be maintained and owned on the basis of Vienna-based uh, Bitpanda GmbH, which manages the execution of trades and uh, takes care of custody. That's brilliant news. Anything to uh, help with the adoption of cryptocurrencies? And this uh, seems like a really good partnership. And following the news from Europe, the largest uh, and oldest American bank, BNY Mellon, launches crypto services. Uh, so they launched a digital custody platform to safeguard clients Ether and Bitcoin on October the 11th, uh, making America's oldest bank the first large bank in the country to offer custody of digital assets and traditional investments uh, on the same platform, which is pretty cool. Uh, however, of course, you need to be aware that the bank will store your private keys and provide bookkeeping services equivalent to those that typically are offered to fund managers in traditional assets so that you're not, per se, the owner of your keys and your assets. You basically have BNY manage it for you, which is, I think, cool, but you still need to trust them to do that. For some people, that's usually probably the way that they want to be able to engage and have them exposed uh, to crypto assets, having someone manage their seed phrases and their wallets and everything else around it, just to uh, pay them the extra money that it requires to keep all that managed. So for some some people, that's probably a, a really good option. Yes, no doubt. I think it's good also stepping stone towards a solution where you're your own custodian. So good to start with it. Now, yeah. next um, piece of adoption here is Google partnering with Coinbase. What an interesting partnership here. 
to accept crypto payments for cloud services. So the company will start accepting crypto payments early next year. And I'm only wondering if maybe at some point it would be possible to not just pay with cryptos for your Google Cloud services, but also perhaps um, do it on an anonymous basis or on the basis of your DAO, right? And in this case, DAOs can finally have access to cloud infrastructure, making it an interesting move towards decentralized economy. That is very interesting. I, I didn't think of that uh, DAO aspect and uh, DAOs requiring to pay for their own services and whatnot. If they're a uh, decentralized exchange, they do have services to pay for and uh, they usually have their own treasury. So I didn't think of that aspect. But from a validator, a node operator, from uh, what uh, I do in the Cardano ecosystem, I do use the rewards that we get from the operating the node to pay mm -hmm. for the cloud infrastructure. So it just gives me as an operator, one of those extra options where I don't need to convert to fiat currency and then make the payments and all that just makes things just that little bit easier. So I, I highly welcome this uh, this uh, new initiative that uh, Google and Coinbase are doing. Absolutely. And hey, uh, last piece of news from my side, a very interesting development related to CBDCs, but you can only wonder if it's through CBDC or not in the future. Uh, so blockchain network Tron has signed an agreement with the government of uh, Dominica, so uh, Caribbean island, to make Tron native tokens authorized as digital currency uh, there, right? So you can see how a official government wants to make a traditional decentralized digital currency, not per se a state-owned CBDC, the uh, means of uh, remittances and transactions in the region, which is, I think really advanced and cool because they are not trying to retain control but they try to uh, relate and uh, use decentralization as means of creating stability in the region that is very cool very interesting move from john there for sure and moving on to some other news items around nfts and also real estate which is a really interesting play that i like to uh uh, get that a little bit more exposure to myself. Roofstock on-chain sells first real estate to NFT purchased with USDC through on-chain home financing. So Roofstock to leverage the teleprotocol to enable financing of tokenized real estate properties with USDC home loan lending pools. So each home is titled in a limited liability company whose ownership is associated with a unique home on-chain which is an NFT on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, so each home on-chain is transferred using smart contracts, which is deployed on the Ethereum network, and the entire transaction takes place transparently on the blockchain. So this is one of those moves where we're slowly seeing some of these older ecosystems of some older industries, real estate, uh, take advantage of blockchain technology and optimize those processes. And I absolutely love this uh, real-world utility, having the NFTs there as the proof of ownership of a property, using it for titles, deeds, and whatnot. There's a whole bunch of other aspects that probably aren't uh, mentioned uh, too well in this, including SSIs, uh, sovereign, self-sovereign identities, and digital identities as well, which plays a huge part of all of this. So it's, uh, it's just the first stepping stones of what we need to be able to take on this uh, move and transform some of these industries such as real estate. Excellent, really. I, I'm pleased to see that the promise of uh, tokenization, the promise of democratized access on the basis of tokenization is working out. And uh, we have this connection between the world of traditional assets and especially real estate and blockchain. So the excellent, excellent move there. Now, this uh, next news item around Ethereum as well. This is Ethereum's wallet, Metamask, adds instant banks to crypto transfers. So this makes a crypto wallet, the Metamask wallet, makes it easier for users to turn their fiat currency into uh, crypto through the integration with fintech firm Sardine. And Metamask's parent company, Consensus, announced this earlier this week. So this is a brilliant play in regards to uh, adoption. If you're, for example, wanting to buy an NFT or participate in DeFi, you can do so straight through the MetaMask wallet. You have that integration, that on-ramp for fiat currencies directly into whatever DeFi protocol or open NFT marketplace that you're using. So that, this is a really good thing in terms of adoption. Excellent. Yeah, MetaMask has become such a, a central place 
in the whole world of decentralized finance. And uh, it's good to see that it's improving. However, I also would like to see the sort of a bit of a democracy with regards to which solutions are offered there. And hopefully it's not going to be the Internet Explorer on Windows type of thing. <laughs> it is a little bit centralized in regards yeah. to uh, the options there. So that there are a lot of other alternatives, uh, just that people aren't aware of them. So it's a, a bit of uh, awareness, I think, for people to understand that there are some other options and uh, maybe even some better options. So uh, different things that we can look at. Sure, you can just install Google Chrome, but uh, you can spend one hour doing that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So for this last news item that we have here, this is with uh, governance in regards to legal issues around it. And uh, this one here, the CFTC has sushi swap in their crosshairs as they mull over legal shakeups. So the popular decentralized crypto exchange, SushiSwap is mulling a revamp of its legal structure and an effort to potentially greater pot uh, potency amidst increased regulatory scrutiny of crypto projects uh, governed by so-called decentralized autonomous organizations. I think this is a little bit of a step backwards for DAOs in general, but uh, we'll just have a look at what's happening here. So Sushi Swaps, whose DAO token holders decide on everything from leadership to artist grants, was advised this month to divvy itself up into a trio of legal entities based in Panama and the Cayman Islands. This new structure proposed by the law firm Athenic and West LLP would mitigate risk according to a write-up posted on September 22nd in Sushi Swap's uh, governance forum. Now, this is all due to a, a legal case around a uh, where last week we saw the Commodities, Commodities Futures Trading Commission sued Okai Dow for alleged violations of US investment laws, seemingly targeting everyone who votes in that Dow. So there's no protection between the DAO and the actual voters in their ecosystem. So this is, like I said, a really big step backwards for decentralized autonomous organizations. Yeah, definitely. I'm of the similar opinion here. I think uh, Sushi probably was on the fence for a while, which way to go. Uh, personally, I think for a large player like this, it's also kind of dangerous to go and become a clear target for regulatory compliance uh, with all the legal entities clearly established out there in the open as opposed to trying to go more decentralized, trying to go more anonymous. So honestly, not sure, but let's see Let's see how it unravels because I guess after this step, there is no way back and they almost start becoming a, a traditional legal entity structure and eventually would need to comply with everything possible and uh, will be surely in the hands of uh, regulatory and compliance laws. I do see a future where we will see decentralized exchanges having KYC and uh, that whole uh, anonymous side of DeFi is uh, eventually going to disappear. That's that's what I see in terms yeah. of regulation around this space. Yeah. So it, it will happen. I, really think I would not be in favor well. of this approach. I think it's a crude type of measure that results from people's lack of understanding of what DeFi is and what it brings and how it should innovate. Because I think there are other ways of uh, mitigating issues that are uh, looked after with the uh, help of KYC. So I think instead of KYC, we could do much, much more to mitigate those as opposed to trying to impose traditional standards and regulatory compliance mechanisms onto players like uh, Sushi. So yeah. We'll see how this space evolves and I, don't, I know a lot of people can get involved with the regulatory frameworks and uh, help influence uh, lawmakers and regulators in the space so uh, keep an eye out and we'll see how this space evolves now this leads us to the end of another episode of late night DeFi. so you can listen to this on anywhere you uh, consume your favorite podcasts please consider giving us a rating and review it really helps the discoverability of this uh, podcast and all the episodes that we create as well so until next time we'll catch you later bye guys